Okay, hi everyone. This is our lecture on chapter four, which is cell structure and function. So in terms of what will be covered in the chapter, right, we'll talk about cells sort of in general. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about prokaryotic cells, talk about eukaryotic cells in general, and then we'll talk about all of the organelles um, that are part of eukaryotic cells. Okay. All right. So if we start off just by talking about, well, it says the cellular level of organization, talking about cells in general, um, it says the detailed study of the cell began in like the 1830s. And obviously this idea that the cell is the, you know, functional unit of living organisms is a concept that basically unifies sort of all of biology, right? And it originated from the work um, of biologists Schleiden and Schwann um, in about 18, 1838 to 1839. And they came up with this cell theory, okay? Um, so all organisms are composed of cells. And again, when we say something's a theory, right, it's well accepted. There's been many, many um, experiments that have supported um, this cell theory. Right, so it says cells are the basic units of structure and function in organisms, and cells come only from pre existing cells because they are self producing. Okay, so that is the cell theory widely accepted, um, a unifying concept of biology, as I said, um, and pretty much, you know, again, this is something that, that, um, won't be disputed, right, because there is so much evidence, um, and the, and the cells are really the basis of living things. Okay, so if we look at the picture here, you can see um, we're looking at a nice pretty little plant there. Um, and basically, and that's a lilac, right? I don't know if anyone has seen a lilac or has a lilac tree in their, in their yard, but they're super fragrant. Um, but if you look at the leaf, right, um, and the structure uh, of the leaf, right, or if you, the leaf tissue, Okay, and then you zoom in and look at those cells, you can see the individual cells um, through that lilac leaf here, right? So this is a cross section through and you can see each one of these is an individual cell, all right? Now, if we look at this cute little bunny here, um, and again, we this is actually taking a cross section through the rabbit's trachea, okay? And again, you can see all these individual cells here. So these are specific types of epithelial cells that are actually ciliated. You can see the cilia here, um, and these are going to line the trachea, right? The trachea is your, um, basically the pathway of air going down from the lungs, right? Um, from the throat down to the lungs. Okay, so it's just showing you that you have cells that make up leaves, right? And plants, living things, right? And cells that are going to make up, um, you know, the living organism, the rabbit, particularly just showing you an example here in the trachea. And you could have taken any tissue and put it, you know, um, sectioned it, right, stained it, and looked at it under a microscope, okay? And so actually, this is what we we went through um, our, our last lab, right, talking about um, or talking about the microscope, right, using the microscope. And again, that's, that's a skill that you get pretty familiar with this um, year using the actual microscope. Unfortunately, you guys aren't going to have that hands-on experience, but again, in subsequent courses, you will. Um, and so basically you could see for both of these, right, you had to add some sort of stain. And I talk about that in the lab as well to be able to visualize these cells. Okay. All right. And so if you think, if you think about kind of sizes of things, um, and what you can observe using what different types of microscopes, right? Remember, I also talked about, or in your lab manual, even in your lab PDF, there's a little comparison between the light microscope, which is the one that we would use in lab. That's the one that I demoed and, and showed you in the lab um, versus the electron microscope where you can see a lot smaller things. You have much higher resolution. OK, and so you can kind of see what you could what you're able to visualize using both types of microscopes here. Right. So if you kind of look at the range of the light microscope, you can see that, you know, you're not going to be able to see individual proteins or even small cellular organelles. But you can see chloroplasts and plants. Um, and actually, in the next lab, um, in the next lab, I'll at least show you, you know, sort of pictures of a particular plant cell. Um, and you can actually see the chloroplast, but you're not going to be able to see any of the other organelles. You can obviously see entire cells. You can see the nucleus, but you're not going to be able to see smaller things, right? So you need an electron, micro electron microscope to see a virus, to see actual proteins. Um, 
And then if you go on this end, obviously you can see the scale up at the top here in terms of size, right? And obviously what you can see with the human eye. All right. Now, in terms of cells themselves, they will range in size as well, okay? Um, <clears throat> so it says from about one millimeter down to one micrometer, right? One millimeter um, down to one micron, okay? Um, they need to have a large surface area um, of the plasma membrane, okay, in order to be able to take in the materials that they need and also to get rid of those materials that they need to um, discard. If that surface area is not, you know, isn't large enough, the cell will not be able to function, okay? So it says um, something here, this surface area to volume ratio. And this is actually something that's addressed in your next lab, your lab for this mod, this, this set of modules. Um, talks a little bit about the surface area to volume ratio and talks about diffusion um, <clears throat> in different sort of model cell sizes, okay? So cells have to be small, okay? Um, if, you, if you think about a large cell versus a small cell, a large cell, um, the surface area relative to the volume will decrease. In small cells, they have a much larger surface area to volume ratio, okay? And again, that's what the cell is gonna need in order to be able to exchange those materials that it needs, okay? So um, this will illustrate that, right? So if you look at this one four centimeter cube, and then that same cube divided up either into eight two centimeter cubes or 64 one centimeter cubes, and you basically look at the surface area right? You can see that that surface area is dramatically increased when you take that same size cube, cube but you divide it up into 64 smaller cubes, okay? Um, if you look at the total volume, it doesn't change, right? It's still the same size, and so the total volume is the same between these three examples, right? But the surface area is much different, and so if you look at the surface area to volume ratio, you could see in this one, you have it six to one. Here, it's only 1.5 to one. So the, the idea is that this one four centimeter cube is not gonna work, not gonna function as a cell because the surface area to volume ratio is too small. It will not have enough surface area, enough plasma membrane, right? To be able to take in those materials that it needs and also not enough surface area to discard those that it doesn't, okay? And so I think this is a nice figure that really illustrates this concept. Um, and like I said, this is something that um, I also, actually not me, it's a, a video, but I'll give you guys something that kind of goes along with this. Um, there's a video that addresses this, that outlines and kind of demos a lab that you could do to illustrate this, okay? All right, so moving on to the next section, which is prokaryotic cells, okay? So it's important that we know just a, you know, sort of just basic difference between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. And I believe there is a table um, that at some point will show you the difference between the two. Um, I think maybe we had, yeah, you know what? I think that table, there was a table like that in actually one of the earlier chapters, maybe in chapter one. So just make sure we know the basic difference between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. Um, and again, a reminder that you should have your review sheet out, right? Now, chapter four is the last chapter on the first exam, on exam one. So you still have that exam one review sheet. You should be filling in your notes, okay? Um, so for prokaryotic cells, right? Think of them as smaller and simpler than eukaryotic cells. Um, excuse me, I have to see. <coughs> Sorry. Um, prokaryotic cells do not have a membrane bound nucleus. And when you think about prokaryotic cells or prokaryotes, usually probably the first um, thing that you'll think about are bacteria, right? Bacterial cells. Those are prokaryotic cells, okay? Um, and so it says they're placed into two taxonomic, do taxonomic domains, bacteria and also archaea. Those are, pro those are prokaryotic cells, okay? Remember the other domain is eukarya, everything in domain eukarya, obviously those are all eukaryotic cells or eukaryotes, right? All the organisms that are part of that domain um, are made up of eukaryotic cells, okay? So for prokaryotic cells, much more simple, smaller, they do not have membrane, a membrane-bound nucleus, they are lacking other membrane-bound organelles that you see in eukaryotes as well, um, and they do have things like ribosomes, okay? And we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so 
it says here, just to kind of point this out, I don't know if I pointed this out. Again, I believe this was in um, chapter one as well. We talked a little bit about or introduced those three domains, right? Main domains. Um, remember, archaea live in extreme habitats. Um, bacteria, we talk about all the time. You take a whole course in microbiology, you'll talk about bacteria a lot as you move through your studies, and we'll talk about them a little bit more here. Um, the one thing to think to just mention here is that bacteria and archaea, yeah, they're both you know, they're prokaryotic cells, right? They're prokaryotes, um, but actually they're two separate domains because they actually are very different biochemically, meaning in terms of the molecules that make up those cells. So at one point they were, they were sort of considered as being very similar, but as we got more and more biochemical evidence, right? Or um, a lot of, you know, more techniques, molecular type of techniques were developed, it was then um, determined that these are actually pretty different from each other, okay? So that's what this is pointing out there. All right, so if we look at the structure of prokaryotes, um, and again, this is something that you'll go over a little bit more too in lab. Part of the lab is just to label the parts of the cell, both the prokaryotes um, and the eukaryotes. So another thing that you'll sort of go over again. Um, I did mention already that they're small. They're much smaller than eukaryotes. They're only about 1 to 1.5 microns wide and about 2 to 6 microns long. And some of the basic shapes, and again, we're really kind of always sort of think about when you're thinking about a prokaryotic cell, think about bacteria, right? Bacterial cells. Um, and so bacteria, they sort of occur in three sort of characteristic shapes, right? So spheres or spherical coccyx, um, rod shape bacillus, and then spiral spirillum. Okay, spirillum um, again have the spiral shape. Okay, so these are the characteristic shapes that you see in prokaryotic cells, particularly again in bacterial cells. Okay, um, and you can call them spirochete if they're flexible. And this is actually, um, you know, if you if you had to take some sort of you know sample or something like that, um, your doctor suspected some sort of bacterial infection. You want to find out what type of bacteria it is, right? And if you took a sample and you looked at these bacteria under the microscope, I, it's important to be able to identify the shape. To then, and then there's obviously other characteristics that they would look at as well, but you want to determine what exact type of bacteria it is. The shape is one thing that's important, okay? In terms of the cell envelope, right? So this is what's going to surround the outside of that bacterial cell or that prokaryote. Because um, again, archaea and bacteria cells have a similar um, sort of structure, right? So this, so kind of all of these things that we're talking about now will apply to both, right? Remember though, they're very different biochemically. Okay, so the cell envelope, which is what's going to surround that cell, right, is made up of a plasma membrane, a cell wall, and something called the glycocalyx. So um, plasma membrane is a lipid bilayer, okay, um, has proteins embedded into it. And so in that sense, it's similar to the plasma membrane that we're going to talk about when we talk about eukaryotic cells. Um, there are also these inter internal pouches that form. You don't have to worry too much about that. Uh, cell wall is there to maintain the shape of the cell. And we mentioned this before. We mentioned peptidoglycan in the last chapter as being a structural carbohydrate, right? So peptidoglycan is a carbohydrate that you, you only see in bacterial cell walls, right? Or um, these prokaryotic cell walls. Then uh, on the outside, there's a layer of polysaccharides, okay? Um, on the, that's called this glycocalyx, okay? And so this is, says it's well organized, resistant to removal. And so that's kind of what some of these bacterial cells will, they form this capsule and that's, that's a result of this layer, okay? So it's kind of um, three layers, okay? which make up that cell envelope. All right, and so this is a picture just showing you those shapes, right? Spirochetes, spirillum, um, coccyx, and bacillus. All right, if you look at the plasma membrane structure, okay, you can see phospholipid bilayer and embedded proteins, okay? All right, and so now if you're gonna look at the structure of the prokaryotic cell here, you know, again, this is something you're going to look at in lab a little bit and just label these. These are some of the basic structures. Um, for the, um, one second, I'm just going to pause. For All right. So as I said, these are, you know, some basic structures that you find in a prokaryotic cell. Okay. Um, now, we should be familiar with some of these basic structures. We did, you know, we talked about the um, nuclear envelope, right? Um, being made up of the plasma membrane, 
this is the cell wall and then remember that capsule on the outside right um, you can see also there are ribosomes right which is the site of protein synthesis this is showing you here it says nucleoid this is this is the dna right the bacterial chromosome um, it is not inside a nucleus right so kind of pretty simple you also see these sort of hair like structures on the outside um, that allow it to adhere to surfaces um, also some bacteria have a flagellum which allow it to move right and propel it forward and so that's really simple sort of basic structure and again what this is showing you here is an electron micrograph of an e coli cell right where you can see kind of some of these structures right um obviously this this just gives you a little more um detail here the little cartoon picture okay so in terms of identifying these parts i on the on the lecture exam will not ask you know will not have a picture like this where you know these are blocked off and i say identify you know um the structure here right and i want you to identify that as a ribosome i will however on the on the lab you know how we're gonna have a lab quiz or a lab exam that will be on there right and like i said you're gonna practice identifying these um in the lab okay so we should be able to identify these major structures here or main structures in the prokaryotic cell all right now um i guess we pretty much i just kind of pointed out these um things in the diagram but maybe there's a couple that i didn't um cytoplasm okay uh, again is gonna essentially surround the ribosomes right and basically is what the nucleoid is sort of suspended in um mostly water and other organic and inorganic molecules enzymes already said this about the nucleoid also though you may find there's plasmids that exist inside those bacterial cells those prokaryotic cells and they're sort of um it's dna but it's sort of extra chromosomal dna so it's not the it's not dna that's part of the main bacterial chromosome um and actually we sort of exploit these and use them in the lab a lot i'm not gonna go any further with that i already mentioned the flagella the fimbrae right and there's also Another thing to mention, something called the conjugation pili, which actually bacteria, bacterial cells will use that to actually pass DNA from one cell to another. And this is super important in basically creating genetic variability within a bacterial population, um, which is going to be important for them to be able to, right, survive and adapt to environments, right? You need to have genetic variations or genetic variation in general for natural selection to occur, okay? And so one of the ways that can happen is they can actually exchange DNA directly. All right. Okay, so the next part is eukaryotic cells. And so obviously most of the chapter we're gonna focus on eukaryotic cells. Okay, so now to start off with just a little bit of an introduction to eukaryotic cells, and then obviously most of the chapter focuses on um, discussing the different parts of the cell and the main function of those organelles right so eukaryotic cells have a membrane bound nucleus right they are larger and they are more complex than prokaryotic cells um, they have specialized organelles um, and also a plasma membrane okay um, there is something called the endosymbiotic theory that um, we're going to talk about in it and what, what that theory does is meant it explains how eukaryotic cells um, came about, right? And how they were derived. And so it says mitochondria, and it particularly pertains to mitochondria and chloroplasts. Um, and it says that they arose when large eukaryotic cell engulfed independent prokaryotes, right? So <clears throat> the idea is, or what the endosymbiotic theory is explaining, again, how did you how did eukaryotic cells um how are they sort of first um developed or in terms of evolution right how are they derived okay um and i'm going to show you a picture that sort of explains it in a, in a little bit more clear way so we'll do that in a second but the one thing to point out is that both mitochondria right and chloroplasts are um they have a double membrane Okay, so this supports this endosymbiotic theory in that it was a larger cell that engulfed um, <clears throat> an individual prokaryote, and then that little individual prokaryote actually became the organelle of that larger cell, 
right? And so in that case, if you think about that, they would then have that organelle would have a double membrane because it had a membrane first as its little smaller prokaryote, and then it was engulfed. And so um, they also contain their own genetic material, okay? Um, and that's another thing that supports this endosymbiotic theory. All right, so if you look at this, so again, this is meant to explain sort of eukaryotic cells and their origin, origin of these complex organelles that, that they have, okay? Um, so here, here's prokaryotic cells. So again, evolutionarily speaking, prokaryotic cells are believed to be around um, first. They're much more simple, right? And then eukaryotic cells evolved later on, okay? So it says here, a cell gains a nucleus by... Um, by the plasma membrane invaginating and surrounding the DNA with a double membrane. Okay, so this is kind of just first showing you the the sort of that cell obtaining a nucleus. Okay, then it says the cell gains an endomembrane system by proliferation of that membrane. And so um, again, there's a nucleus here, um, and there's this you know this double membrane, and then that membrane then sort of um, proliferates more, and you get this endomembrane system. And we're going to talk about that endomembrane system, okay? Um, then it's a cell gains mitochondria, right? So this is what I was just talking to you about on the previous slide. So this says it's an aerobic bacterium, right? So this is a prokaryotic cell, aerobic meaning it utilizes oxygen, right? It says it here. Um, has the ability to utilize oxygen um, and break down carbohydrates in order to generate energy. And that's what happens in the mitochondria. And so it's believed that this larger cell engulfed these aerobic bacteria and they became their mitochondria, okay? For chloroplasts, if we're talking about, right, a plant cell, there are also photosynthetic bacteria, okay? These are bacteria or prokaryotes that can actually photosynthesize. Okay, so the the theory states that um, this larger cell engulfed these smaller photosynthetic bacteria, and that then became a functioning chloroplast within this larger cell. Okay, and so again, this is just a summary of this endosymbiotic theory. So we should understand this. I don't know that um, I'm going to ask you to memorize these steps or anything like that, um, but it's really more about understanding. So understanding. Um, that this endosymbiotic theory, again, is meant to explain how eukaryotic cells obtain these complex organelles, right? The idea is that they engulfed these smaller um, prokaryotes, all right? And so I'll leave it at that. So now we want to talk about these specialized organelles that exist within eukaryotic cells, okay? So I mentioned this already. Um, we say that the, they're carp compartmentalized, meaning they have all of these different membrane-bound organelles. And those organelles perform specific functions, right? And because they're membrane-bound, they provide this sort of isolated environment where different types of chemical reactions can occur, okay? The way that we're going to break this down, we're going to break it down into two classes. So organelles that are part of the endomembrane system, and it kind of, the name sort of tells you what that is, basically all of these organelles are connected by membranes, okay? So we'll talk about them um, first, and so that's what it says, organelles that communicate with one another. Again, they're all connected via, via this membrane system, okay? And again, that's what this states here. Then we'll talk about energy-related organelles. We just mentioned them when we were just talking about the endosymbiotic theory, mitochondria, and chloroplasts, okay? It says they're independent and self-sufficient, right? We said this, they have their own DNA. Um, those are the energy-related organelles. All right, so <clears throat> I told you, I knew there was a table that compared prokaryotes and eukaryotes. All right, so these are all things that we talked about already. Here are some of the organelles that we're going to talk about in more detail as we move forward. And basically, you can see if they're present in prokaryotic cells um, and also, or, or if they're present in eukaryotic cells, and then this is gonna divide up animal versus plant cells, okay? So this, this table is actually pretty informative and kind of breaks everything down in a simple way. All right, so this 
I'm not going to like sit here and go through this right now in any means. This slide, um, in fact, if I show it, like if we're sitting in class and I put this up on the screen, you can't even really read these words, okay? But they're there. You can read them on your own when you when you look at this. Um, and it's kind of nice to have everything all in one place, right? So this is showing you um, where these organelles are within the cell, what they look like, but then also giving you a basic function too. So it's kind of nice to kind of study from this. Um, and again, just like I said with the prokaryotes, in terms of identifying organelles um, from a diagram, I'll do that in your lab quiz, okay? But for the lecture exam, it's really understanding function, okay? So I like to kind of separate those out just because it makes things a little more clear and a little bit easier, I think, to study. All right, so now we're gonna talk about each one of these organelles that are listed here. Again, this is really a nice sort of summary to show everything together, okay? Same thing for the plant cell. And again, in lab, you're going to go through this. You're going to label these organelles from a diagram. In fact, the diagrams in your lab manual or in the PDF that I'm going to have, you know, you guys are going to have and be completing. These are the same exact diagrams. OK. All right. So <clears throat> let's talk about these organelles. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the nucleus and the ribosomes. OK, so the nucleus where the DNA right houses the DNA um, it says it's the command center of the cell. It's separated from the plasma from the cytoplasm by the nuclear envelope. OK, so that nuclear envelope has a double membrane. And then there's also pores within that double membrane, which allow things like proteins to get into and out of the nucleus. OK, so I mean, super important. Think about it. I mean, if we think about the DNA being housed in the nucleus, right? <clears throat> you know, DNA replication is going to occur in the nucleus, transcription occurs in the nucleus. And so there are specific proteins that are necessary for those functions, right? They need to get into um, and then into the nucleus. And then also, you know, once RNA is transcribed or once you do transcription, right? And we have RNA, that messenger RNA, that messenger RNA then needs to get out of the nucleus. OK, so those pores allow exchange of materials like that. Um, says it contains chromatin, right? So DNA, right? If we think about how DNA um, is packaged or what form DNA is in, we call that chromatin because um, the DNA is actually just the genes, right? The genetic material, but it is packaged with certain proteins in order for it to essentially fit into that nucleus, okay? Um, <clears throat> then that can further condense that chromatin. So chromatin, let me just make that clear, chromatin is just a general term um, describing DNA and its associated proteins, okay? And then there are different forms of chromatin. We're not gonna talk about that here in this course, but it is something that we focus a little bit more on when we get to cell bio. Um, so that chromatin can condense further to form chromosomes. So if you think about, and we'll, we're gonna do this in couple chapters. Um, if you think about mitosis, right, cell division, and you think about what you do is you follow those chromosomes, okay? So the reason why you can really visualize um, the DNA at that point, because they're in the form of chromosomes, right? So we kind of think of them as looking as like X's, right? So again, we'll, we'll, we'll do that a little bit more um, when we get to talking about um, well, the genetics chapter, but also when we talk about mitosis and meiosis, okay? So for right now, we just wanna know that the DNA or the chromatin is inside the nucleus, okay? That's it. So I probably blabbed on a little bit longer than I should have. Um, also within the nucleus, there's something called a nucleolus, which is composed of ribosomal RNA. And that's actually where the subunits of the ribosomes are assembled and made, okay? So the nucleolus. All right, so this is showing you the nucleus here, right? So we talked about the nuclear envelope. We, here's the nucleolus, right? And you can see actually here these sort of darker kind of thread-like structures here. That's the chromatin, okay? Then it's also zooming in and showing you some of these pores, right? We talked about the pores in the nuclear envelope as being there to allow things to get inside the nucleus and also be exported out. And if you want to look at an actual electron micrograph, right, you can actually see these pores. So you couldn't use a light microscope to get an image like this, right? In order to be able to see something so small like this, you would need to use a electron microscope. And that's what this image is. All right. Now, ribosomes. <clears throat> Next thing we're going to talk about, we should automatically know what the what happens at the ribosome, what the function of the ribosome is. Protein synthesis, 
okay? Ribosomes are composed of rRNA, which is ribosomal, right? Little r, ribosomal RNA, and also protein, okay? There's a large subunit, there's a small subunit, and like I said in the last slide, those subunits are made in the nucleolus. Again, we will talk more about ribosomes when we talk about translation, right, in a later chapter, okay? So a lot of these things or some of these things are going to be sort of coming back again in later chapters, all right? So right now, we just want to know basic, basic function, okay? All right. Now, ribosomes can be located in two different places in the cell, either on the endoplasmic reticulum, right, or the ER. And so we call that part of the endoplasmic reticulum the rough ER. So RER or rough ER means there are ribosomes on it, okay? Um, <clears throat> also, you can have ribosomes free in the cytoplasm, okay? And they can actually be single or they can be in groups called polyribosomes. All right, and so let's look at a little picture here. So again, here's your nucleus, right? Here's that nuclear envelope that we talked about. And now this is the endoplasmic reticulum. And um, it should really be showing you kind of this studded with ribosomes. So if it was studded with ribosomes or had ribosomes on there, it's the rough ER. We'll see that again, um, and I'll make sure I point that out in, in subsequent figures. Um, <clears throat> what this is showing you, is sort of focusing on the function of the ribosome, right? So I mentioned this also before, right? So in the nucleus, right, we have transcription that occurs. You make mRNA. That mRNA needs to be transported out of the nucleus, right? And then it will be translated on the ribosome. So this is showing you the ribosome. Um, and then this is actually showing you um, <clears throat> it going to the endoplasmic reticulum here, this ribosome, and then this protein entering into the endoplasmic reticulum. OK, um, I think this figure is a little bit sort of beyond our our sort of scope right now. So it's really meant to be illustrative. So I don't. So right now, I'm not going to expect you to um, know details here. And in fact, this wouldn't be a figure that I would include on the exam and ask you to understand what's going on. OK, we haven't talked about this yet. It's sort of out of place. But the reason why I leave it in is because it's just kind of showing you an overview in terms of the function of the ribosome, okay? So in terms of details, don't worry about this, okay? So like if this figure is confusing you, just don't even look at it right now, all right? Okay, <clears throat> now we're gonna continue on talking about this endomembrane system, right? So again, remember, it's I showed you it, right? This sort of, I sort of started to show you this nuclear envelope, right? And then the endoplasmic reticulum. This is all part of the endomembrane system, okay? Um, <clears throat> okay, so series of intracellular membranes that compartmentalize the cell. Um, it says they restrict enzymatic reactions to specific compartments. Again, things are going to happen inside. Like So just like that pic this picture here showed you this protein going inside the, 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 the ER, right? It says the lumen of the ER. Things can then happen to that protein, right? There are certain reactions um, that occur inside the ER that couldn't occur out in the cytoplasm, okay? So that's sort of illustrating this sort of compartmentalization that occurs um, in this endomembrane system, okay? All right, um, so nuclear envelope, right? Membranes of the endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, we haven't talked about that yet, and then also vesicles. These are all part of the endomembrane system, okay? All right, so we were mentioning the ER, right? The endoplasmic reticulum, so let's talk a little bit more about that. So again, if you, and if you look at that picture, and you'll see the next picture, it just, right, it's, it looks like flattened vesicles. It's, it's membrane, okay? Um, again, rough ER, studded with ribosomes, and basically, you know, when we talk about the rough ER, we kind of say protein synthesis, but really the protein synthesis, and that's what this is saying, anabolism, right, synthesis. Um, the synthesis part of it is happening on the ribosome that's sitting um, on the ER, okay? Once that protein, like I said here, right, enters the inside of the ER, it can then be modified, okay? And so that's an important function of the rough ER. So that's what this is saying here, okay? Again, you don't need to know specifically how it's modified. Just know, right, in the rough ER, there's proteins made in the ribosome, they get sent inside, and then there's some sort of, um, there's modifications that are going to occur to the protein, or the protein gets processed in some way, okay? And again, we leave it at that at this point. All right. 
The smooth ER, however, doesn't have any ribosomes. Proteins are not going to be processed in the smooth ER, but what, what does happen in the smooth ER is lipids are synthesized, okay? So if you think about function of rough ER, you might say mod proteins are modified, right? For ribosome, you would say protein synthesis, okay? For smooth ER, for basic function, lipid synthesis, okay? There are also other um, functions as well. So it says various synthetic processes, detoxification, storage. Um, so in like liver cells, there's lots of smooth ER because it's involved in detoxification, okay? Just an example. Also, transport vesicles are formed in the smooth ER, okay? So I hope you can tell, you know, see the difference between rough ER and smooth ER. Okay, and so this is showing you it here, right? So again, here's your Here's your nucleus, right? Your nuclear envelope. You can see that the endoplasmic reticulum is continuous with that nuclear envelope. And you can see here, this is the rough ER, right? It has the ribosomes on it. And here is the smooth ER, okay? And again, if you, this is an actual electron micrograph, again, that they sort of pseudo colored, just to show you the difference here. But here's um, the rough ER. You can see the ribosomes that sort of in black studded on it. And then this is smooth ER, okay? <clears throat> All right. Now, <clears throat> moving on through this endomembrane system, the next thing you're talking about is the Golgi apparatus, okay? So it says, consists of flattened curved saccules. Again, in terms of kind of what it looks like, it looks similar to the ER, okay? It says it resembles a stock of hollow pancakes. Now here, in terms of function of Golgi, one of the things that happens is proteins and lipids are modified, okay? They're modified further. Um, but really, if you're gonna think of just kind of one function of the Golgi, you'll say it's sort of the shipping and packaging center of the cell, okay? So um, it'll basically take those proteins and prepare them um, or sort of, so here, let's think about this. They'll sort of identify those proteins, right? package them and prepare them for wherever they need to go in the cell, right? Some of them may be um, exported out of the cell because they're, they're, they're secreted proteins, right? And they need to be secreted out of the cell. So think about like a cell that produces a certain hormone, right? It would need to then release that hormone, okay? And so that would then be packaged in the Golgi apparatus and sent to the plasma membrane and secreted out of the cell, okay? Some, sometimes there, and a lot of times there are proteins that are needed within that cell and then they'll be sent um, to wherever they need to go, okay? So the Golgi is the sort of packaging and sorting center. It identifies the protein, determines where it needs to go and then prepares it and gets it ready for shipment, okay? And so <clears throat> you can see that here, um, <clears throat> it's gonna, it's basically, this is showing you the, the Golgi apparatus, right? You can see that things are moving through the ER to the Golgi, okay? Enters here, which is called the cis phase. You don't need to know that. And then exits in the trans phase. Um, I mean, maybe, maybe, I shouldn't say you don't need to know that, but we should, I mean, I think it's kind of a pretty simple concept. I think the idea is that for you to understand is that, um, you know, there's one side that's sort of the entrance and one side that's the exit, okay? So again, these proteins are coming in the Golgi identifies those proteins, says, all right, I know you are a secreted protein. You need to be targeted to the membrane and secreted out, okay? So it's gonna tag those proteins appropriately so that they go to where they need to go, okay? So this secreted protein, if it went somewhere like within the cell somewhere else, it's not gonna function, right? It only functions as a secreted protein. So it has to go to the appropriate place, all right? And so you can see that it moves um, both from the ER to the Golgi in a transport vesicle, right? Also from the Golgi to the plasma membrane through a transport vesicle. So all of these proteins um, are always enclosed in membrane, right? Whether they're in the ER or whether they're in the Golgi or moving, you know, from the Golgi to the plasma membrane, they're then packaged in a vesicle. All of those things are made up of membrane, right? And so that's why we're calling this the endomembrane system. Okay, um, <clears throat> another type of organelle. So, okay, so the endomembrane system is what we, we, we just talked about, right? ER, well, let's start with nuclear envelope, right? You can kind of see that here, nuclear envelope, rough ER, right? Smooth ER and then Golgi apparatus, and also those vesicles 
that move these things around as well, okay? Now, we're also gonna talk about another type of organelle called the lysosome, okay? These are also membrane bound, okay? Um, they're produced by the Golgi apparatus and they actually contain digestive enzymes, okay? So, um, and we're gonna sort of consider them sort of part of the endomembrane system because they're, they're membranous, okay? Um, <clears throat> and they sort of work together with some of the components of the endomembrane system. Um, again, we're not going to get into all of these nit nitty gritty details. Let's just know basic function here. So for lysosomes, you want to think of them as a vesicle, right? Like we were just talking about. But inside that vesicle, there's actually digestive enzymes, okay? And so these digestive enzymes are there to break down molecules, okay? So we call the lysosomes the digestive systems of the cell, okay? Um, and so... so <clears throat> It says here, white blood cells have a greater proportion of lysosomes, okay? Why? If you think about, you know, immune, an immune cell, let me just see if I have a good picture of that. I guess not. If you think about it, and white blood cells are immune cells, right? They're there to fight off disease. And there are certain types of white blood cells um, <clears throat> whose job is to engulf viruses and bacteria, right? And then basically get rid of them. And so once that white blood cell would engulf that bacteria or that virus, it would come in, it would then fuse with the lysosome. I actually do have a picture of this in a second. You know what, let me show you right now as I'm explaining this. Um, <clears throat> so this is what this is showing you here, right? So think about this as being a, a bacteria, right? Or a virus. It comes in, so this is a white blood cell, right? It comes in as a vesicle, kind of pinches off the membrane. Again, this is all made up of the same thing, membranes. It then fuses with a lysosome here that has all these enzymes in it, right? And then it can break down that bacteria and get rid of it, okay? So that's what this is showing you here. I'll come back to this in a second, but I think it was easier to see that picture to understand what I was talking about. Now, there are certain genetic diseases that um, are um, tied to lysosomes, right? Where you have a, a defect in a specific enzyme, Right? So we said the lysosomes are composed of di digestive enzymes that break down things like bacteria just to destroy them. Um, but there are certain genetic diseases where you have a defect in one of those enzymes. Okay, And so that means if, if something is coming into that lysosome, it won't be able to be broken down. Okay, So there, the lysosomes will also break down um, <clears throat> lipids. Okay, And so in this case, there's a you know, lysosome lysosomal storage disease called Tay-Sachs. And I, you may have heard of that before. Again, it's a genetic disorder where you have a defect in one of these lysosomal enzymes. And so because that fatty substance that is normally broken down by, by the lysosome doesn't occur because there's a defect in it, um, basically that fatty substance will accumulate and it will cause neurons, right? brain cells to die, okay? And then obviously it'll lead to uh, dysfunction of the nervous system, okay? All right, so this is just showing you lysosome again. Um, <clears throat> this is actually showing you, um, yeah, so this is actually showing you inside the lysosome. You actually can see a mitochondria and also a peroxisome. So uh, the lysosomes, right, can also actually break down old organelles within the cell too. So this in the cell, again, we're not going to talk about this too much. It's something we talk about later on in cell bio, but um, <clears throat> the cell has the ability to break down older organelles that may not be functioning as well as they should, right? Um, and so again, the lysosome has these enzymes that can break things down. And so that they would enter into the lysosome, be broken down, and that would um, help with sort of turnover and keeping that cell healthy. Here, this is actually showing you, so we just talked about the defective lysosomes and Tay-Sachs disease. You can actually see accumulation of this fatty substance inside. And again, eventually this will cause the cell to die, okay? All right, um, <clears throat> so just to summarize, right? I'm gonna go back to that figure that I had just showed you before that really summarizes that whole endomembrane system. Um, Okay, so if you want, let's go through the words here, I guess, but it says proteins are produced in the rough ER, right? And lipids are pro produced in the smooth ER. They get carried in vesicles to the Golgi apparatus. That Golgi apparatus might modify those lipids or proteins. It will then also sort and package them and basically make sure they end up in vesicles 
and then are targeted to the right um, part of the cell, whether that's the plasma membrane or somewhere else. Okay, so that's that's if we're talking about a secretory protein, like I showed you before, it'll get packaged in a secretory vesicle, right? And then it will be released from the cell via exocytosis. Um, <clears throat> and then I, we also talked about this, right? Lysosomes can fuse with incoming vesicles to digest macromolecules. I, I talk to you about that. I was giving you the example, though, of this being a bacteria. This can be a macromolecule. It can be a complex protein or something like that that's being taken in. It gets broken down. Um, and basically, you know, again, it, it can destroy the bacteria or it can break down this macromolecule and then it can reuse some of the subunits. Um, those digestive enzymes and lysosomes can break down older organelles like I showed you as well before. Okay, so you can kind of see that these are sort of part, these are part of the endomembrane system because they're coming from the Golgi, they're coming from that. Okay, so we consider lysosomes as part of the endomembrane system. So this is showing you the pathway where you're going to secrete a protein and release it. This is showing you something incoming like a bacteria or virus that the cell wants to destroy. Okay, but you can see it's still um, that these two processes involve this endomembrane system. All right, so again, this is a nice summary slide of the endomembrane system. So again, the nuclear envelope, rough ER, right? Smooth ER where you have lipids synthesized and then um, lipids or proteins being packaged into vesicles and sent to the Golgi where they're modified and then sorted and packaged. Um, <clears throat> and then again, if it's destined, the easiest kind of thing to conceptualize is that these proteins here need to be secreted out of the cells. So they'll get, they'll, they will get packaged into a secretory vesicle and then sent out, okay? You also do have the cell taking in larger things like bacteria or macromolecules, which then need to be broken down. And in that case, that vesicle that, that basically um, was initially formed will fuse with a lysosome. Those enzymes that exist in the lysosome will then be able to break down whatever was taken in. Okay, so you can see how all of these things all work together. All right. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the presentation right here, and then I'll just put up another one for the last part of the chapter. So that's the end of part one. I'll pick up with microbodies and vacuoles, um, and we'll talk about the cytoskeleton and things like that in the second part.